one of the joys of doing something like this is every once in a while you forget to do something that you were so intent on doing uh, that you can't imagine how you forgot it. But one point before we start on into the next part of this is that we were talking in the first commentary on how there were 3,000 men who were the group and they were killed when Moses came down off the mountain because they were unrepentant. And these are the men who seem to have been the ones who got Aaron to build the golden calf. The goal of this group of people seems to have been the appearance of all that we can find is that these people were trying, trying to take control of the Hebrew people away from Moses and using the fact that he was away and getting the people to worship the calf, and they would control the worship of the calf. They would be the ones who would do that, and they would get the people to follow them. So it wasn't the whole group of people who were there under the mountain waiting for Moses to come down who were the unrighteous ones. It appears to have been these 3,000, and they paid for that kind of disobedience to God, that attempted usurping of authority of God, from God, using the excuse of Moses being gone with their lives. Now, the basic thing I want to get here is that the Lord, from the very first of the expedition these people have out of Egypt, the Lord is trying to get them to trust him. And he's showing them incredible things and saying, trust me, trust me, trust my leaders, all the rest of it. Give you one example. We'll go through a bunch of them as they happen, as they're listed. And you'll see how the people react, what, what the challenge is, how the people react to it, what the Lord did, and how he handled the program. But you have to remember where these people were coming from. One of the things that was major were these people. There were hundreds of years of slaves where everything, in essence, was organized for them in the sense that their work, their being slaves, they were told what to do, where to go, all the rest of it. And although they would worship God, they didn't have an organized worship. They didn't have a religious leader. They just had what amounted to a philosophy. And there were only 70 people, including Jacob and Joseph and Joseph's two small children, who were all the Hebrews on the face of the earth when Jacob led them out of Canaan into Egypt and now there's a couple of million. They needed a place to grow in numbers because the place they were going to go to, the place Heavenly Father wanted them to go, was Canaan. And I used to think that had to be some backwater, out-of-the-way place. I couldn't have been more wrong if I had tried. That was the critical area on the entire face of the earth, the known world at that time, because virtually all the world trade that happened took place between Egypt on the south and the Assyrian, Babylonian, whatever empires to the northeast. And all, almost all of that trade traveled down between two highways, the Via Maris on the coast and the King's Highway inland. And right dead center in the middle is Jericho, the Valley of Jericho. And that's where the Hebrews were going to go in and start there. And if they were there and in control of that area, they would have had the central focus of all world trade would have gone through them. It would have made them rich, would have made them powerful. That sort of thing happened to Solomon anyway. But it also would have given them an influence for good over all of the civilizations in that area. And God knew that all the people that were there, the little tribes were there, the Jebusites and the Hivites and the Amorites and all the rest of us, they were morally corrupt. They were heathen worshipers. They were, they were ripe for destruction. And so what God wanted was to put a righteous people there. He knew he couldn't have done it with just Jacob and 70 people because they wouldn't have been strong enough. So he needed to put them in Egypt, and this gave them the chance to grow in numbers with some security. But over and over again, Heavenly Father saying, trust me, trust me, trust me, and these people have a problem. Give you an idea. There's, an old, there's a story in Switzerland about some English botanists who come to Switzerland and they're looking for some rare herbal plants, some flowers that are supposed to have magnificent herbal properties in the late 1800s. 
and they hike around, hike around, hike around, and all of a sudden one day they see down the bottom, down not the bottom, but part way down this humongous huge cliff, some of these plants growing wild, but it is a long way down the cliff, and these guys have got rope, but they're also grown men, and they don't want to go down over the side on the rope they've got. Well, they notice that there's a young boy, about eight or nine years old, who's been following them all day, Swiss boy. And they call the boy over, and they say, look, we've got enough rope to get you down to these flowers, and we'll all hold you on the rope. There's ten of us. And we'll give you a gold coin if you can bring us these flowers up. We want to take them back to England where they're, they're important for medicine. We can do things with them. We can help people's lives. And the boy runs away. And they think maybe they've scared him. But a little while later, the boy comes back with an older man, obviously has the appearance of a farmer, a hard worker. And the boy says to them, some of the most profound words that you'll ever hear, he says, you can lower me over the edge for me to get the flowers if you let my dad hold on to the rope, my father hold on to the rope. The thing was, his, he trusted his father. He knew his father would not let that rope go, no matter what. He didn't know the men. And what Heavenly Father wanted was to build that level of trust in there. So in the first instance of a problem, these people are at the shores of the Red Sea. And all of a sudden the Egyptian army shows up, all the chariots and the army and the Pharaoh and all the rest of it. And what do the people do? Do they say, oh great, this is wonderful. Now we're going to see how the power of the Lord. Know what they say? Because, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us to die in the wilderness? You know, we told you to leave us alone. It would be better to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. The Lord's solution was to tell Moses to hold up his staff. The Red Sea was divided. The people went through on dry ground. They all got to the other side. All got to the other side. And when the Egyptians chased them, to come across and get them. The whole army of the Egyptians, all the chariots, all the horses, all the people who were chasing them, drowned. Lesson for the people to learn. You only need me to fight for you. You have no arms, no weapons, you have no skills. The army of Pharaoh was the mightiest army known at the face of the earth at that time. No army on the face of the earth was stronger. Who was doing the fighting? God was doing the fighting. He wanted them to trust him. I will fight for you. We can see from what happens just a little while later, they didn't get the message. They come to the place called Mera, bitter waters. They can't drink it. What do they do? They murmured, what shall we drink? And what does God do? God shows uh, Moses a tree. They throw the tree into the water. The water becomes sweet. They have water to drink. Then they go to a place called Elam. There are 12 wells of water there. There's 70 palm trees there. They encamp there by the waters. This is in Exodus chapter 15. The lesson is, I will help you. You need water, I'll get you water. You need food, I'll get you food. We'll get you what you need. So every time they're facing a challenge, he's saying, I am the solution. I am the solution. Believe in me. I will feed you. I will see to it you have water. I will look after you. And, if, and the more experiences they had, sometimes it looked like the less they trusted them, but eventually they started to.